All right. Welcome, everybody. Thanks for uh, joining us for this lunchtime presentation of Wildflowers in Your Backyard with uh, Marlene Bornman, who is uh, an author of several books, including three for Colorado Mountain Club Press on uh, identifying wildflowers. And, and she'll, I know she has a slide pretty early uh, with her three books, so I'll let her get into that. But um, just real quick housekeeping. Uh, my name is Jeff Golden. I'm a publisher for CMC Press, so I'm a full-time uh, CMC employee. Um, I would ask, you'll see everybody is automatically muted uh, for the time being, and we're going we're gonna to keep that uh, locked down for the presentation. But at the very end, I will unmute everybody, and that way, if anybody has questions or just want to chat with Marlene after her uh, slideshow is over, we'll have that opportunity. Um, in the meantime, if you do have questions or comments as the presentation is rolling, uh, I would encourage you to use the chat feature, and I will, if there's a relevant question uh, that's you know appropriate to, to jump in as she's going, I'll, um, I'll ask the question on your behalf. Otherwise, just feel free to, to save those until the end when I'll unmute everybody and we'll have more of a more of a group chat type uh, type call. Um, I do want to say that this is a, a free presentation that the CMC has been doing a series of free virtual digital events um, during the pandemic, just trying to make sure that we're serving the needs of Coloradans that, that love the outdoors. Um, we do encourage, you know, if this is something that at the end you feel like you got some value out of it. Um, we do have some donations set up if you go to cmc.org slash donate, um, or you can just Venmo and, and I'll drop all this in the chat as well. So you can have the links and, and stuff like that. And um, I also know that uh, uh, Marlene's books are very popular and CMC members automatically get 20% off of CMC Press books, but for everybody in attendance here today, um, I did create a discount code for 25% off. So if you want a little bit extra off of Marlene's books, um, the discount code for the cmcpress.org website is Wild Wednesday. And that was in the email um, that had the link this morning and I'll also, I'll also drop it in the chat so that everybody can see it there. Uh, but without without further ado, I will turn it over to Marlene and um, let her tell you guys all about wildflowers and wildflower identification. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Um, this is Marlene, and we know it's summer, and it's very hard to miss the Rocky Mountain wildflowers in summer. And no, I'm not a botanist, um, but I have spent many decades in the mountains here in Colorado always learning their common names and photographing wildflowers. And about 15 years ago, I decided I wanted to know more. I was really curious about flower families and where they grew and how they were related to each other. So I started taking classes with the CSU Extension Office here in Larimer County and taking classes and field trips with botanists and I also joined the Colorado Native Plant Society. Again, taking classes in the classroom and also field trips. Finally earning my Native Plant Master. I developed a real passion for learning about our native plants. I find it very satisfying and uh, pleasurable. I still love to climb high peaks, but now when I see a flower, I'm usually able to identify it. And I will tell you, you can't combine peat bagging with wildflowering. It just usually doesn't work. If you're trying to climb a peak, you're going pretty fast and light. And if you're going out for wildflowers, you're going to want to go slow and spend a lot of time with the flowers, really looking at them. And that does take a lot of time. And also, the more you learn, the more questions you have, which I find again, very um, satisfying to think of another question and go and find out about it. Okay, I don't know why this is not advancing. Um, Jeff, I've lost control of my screen. All right. Um, can you just hit escape, like uh, exit out I, of the... I'm trying to, and it won't let me escape. So maybe I... Do you have control of my screen? Um, I shouldn't. Hold on. 
It worked a few minutes ago. Okay, maybe I just hit the wrong. Okay, so all of this curiosity about flowers and taking classes led me to do these books with the Colorado Mountain Club. And the first one I did was Rocky Mountain Wildflowers. And it's a, um, a little pack guide that helps you identify flowers by color. And that's how it's arranged. And I've also put information about the habitat a flower grows in and the characteristics of that flower to help you better uh, identify them. The best front range wildflower hikes is a pack guide that highlights 22 hikes across the front range from the plains to the alpine. Again, giving you good ideas, good hikes to go to find wildflowers. And the last one that came out last year was Rocky Mountain Alpine Flowers. And I really feel that the tundra is a very special place in our state. In fact, Colorado has more areas of tundra tundra than anywhere else in the lower 48. So those plants that grow above 11,000 feet, I thought deserve their own pack guide. And so here it is. And a few months ago, I thought in this time of uncertainty, we needed something reliable and upbeat to look forward to. And Colorado native wildflowers will come up no matter what and bloom, and they will not disappoint us. So I started developing this program for people to see, um, just to give us a little uplifting and things to do while we're in this um, time of uncertainty. And native plants are resourceful and persistent and resilient, much like I find that we are in today. And I'm sure you've all been out on trails looking for wildflowers, seeing flowers, and um, hopefully enjoying them. And you probably have your favorites like I do. So my intent today is to spark your interest if you're a beginner in native plants. And if you're a veteran, I hope I can possibly add something to your knowledge. And feel free to share with me too at the end and I can learn from you as well. That's what's fun about learning about native plants. So Colorado um, climate is determined by layers of altitude, calling life zones. And Colorado has five life zones, from the plains to the alpine. And the plains range from 3,300 feet to 5,600 feet, the foothills to about 8,000 feet, the montane zone to 10.5, the subalpine to 11,500 feet, and the alpine here in Colorado to 14,431 feet, which I'm sure all of you know is our highest point in Colorado, Mount Albert. And there are no clear boundaries between life zones, um, especially with some climate change happening. So you may have a field guide that says a flower grows in the montane zone. You're likely to find it in the subalpine as well. Again, there's no clear boundaries. Um, as Wilbur Weber said in his book, uh, Bill Weber, is um, plants don't read books. So they don't know they're supposed to be just in the montane life zone. They grow, that's what's great about nature. It just happens where it happens and it's very variable. Habitats, very good to be aware of and know. And Colorado is a very diverse state in habitats from tundra, scree slopes, woodlands, wetlands, stream sides, meadows, canyons, shrublands, and prairies, and even some disturbed areas by fire, flood, maybe disturbed by animals and man. <clears throat> because if you know the habitat where um, a plant likes to put its feet, it gives you a head start where to find it. So being aware of habitats and what grows in those certain habitats 
is um, will help you identify and know where to look for certain wildflowers. I get asked a lot, when does a certain flower bloom? We certainly have our early sp spring flowers that grew in April and May. We have midsummer flowers in July and even some late bloomers. But there's still a lot of variables to blooming times, depending on the elevation you're at, temperatures that are going on that spring and summer, precipitation, including that your snowpack can affect blooming time, wind and storms that are coming through, and soil conditions that could have changed, again, by flooding, fires, or disturbance from animals or man. But for me, the ever-changing wildflower blooms from year to year makes um, my seasons new and challenging. I can go to the same trail at the same day I went last year, expecting to find a flower, and maybe it's not up yet, or maybe it's past bloom. And sometimes I don't even find the plant at all. But again, that's what's so interesting and it keeps me um, a pleasurable activity is to see, is it gonna be there this year? The bottom line is nature's in charge of blooming time. I can't do these programs without mentioning wildflower ethics which I'm sure all of you are well aware that living organisms need to reproduce and picking and digging up wildflowers will reduce that plant's ability to reproduce and will affect its long-term survival in that location. And picking wildflowers can adversely affect pollinators and other animals that depend on that species for food and or shelter. Picking wildflowers prevents other visitors from enjoying a natural environment and maybe seeing that special plant. And most wildflowers wilt and perish soon after being picked anyway. And most do not survive being transplanted, especially our wild orchids and lilies. So I borrow a quote from a pretty known um, knowledgeable person and lover of wildflowers, Al Schneider. He says, admire them in the wild and let them live. I just take a bazillion photos and that's how I remember them and take them home with me. <clears throat> we all need plants to survive and plants are organized in a scientific classification from kingdom to species. There's about 155 flowering families in Colorado. And I certainly use common names. I use them all the time. One, because scientific names can be hard to pronounce. They're usually Greek or Latin. Um, but I will tell you, after hanging around a lot of botanists the last few years, they all seem to pronounce it a little different. So I don't worry about it too much. But if you saw this plant in the right-hand corner out on the trail and you come back and you wanna tell your neighbor that you saw a one-sided pinstamen, they may be thinking of a little different plant than you saw because there's 60 species of pinstamen in Colorado about 29 species of pinstemon on the front range. So they may be thinking of a different species of the pinstemon than you actually saw. But if you went back and told your neighbor you saw a pinstemon fagatus, and they can look it up, if they don't know that scientific name, look in a book, but they will know exactly what species of penstemon you saw that day. Again, one plant can have one, two, three, four, five different common names, depending on maybe what region you're living in, maybe what generation you use. So the plant in the corner there is a one-sided penstemon. That's a common name for it. 
or a beardless side bell pinstamen. But for clear communication, use or be familiar with the scientific name. So if you're serious about going out and identifying plants to the correct species, what tools do you need? You need books with keys. These are field guides. I use um, Four of Colorado, this is Acrofields, or Bill Weber, Flora, Colorado Flora of the Eastern Slope, either one. And I'll explain in a minute what keys are. <clears throat> and I don't carry these in the field usually, they're pretty big books, but taking a hand lens is very important because often the keys will say something like this, that the leaves are covered with fine hairs along the margins. You're most likely not to be able to see these fine hairs without a hand lens. I take a small notepad with me because if I don't have time or I get stuck in the field, I'm trying to find out what kind of flower this is, um, what species it is, I take notes, what habitat I'm in, what altitude, um, the arrangement of the leaves and the shapes and the petals. And then maybe I can figure it out when I get home. I take a camera. I take lots of pictures of them. And here's a tip. Take a photo of the back of the petals um, along the stem, because the key may say something like there's purple dark streaks behind on the back side of the petals. And if you don't look or take a photo, you might be stuck right there in the key and not be able to go on to find what exact species it is. Definitely take a friend. It's really fun to go back and forth uh, when you get down to the last few keys and decide what uh, plant this is, what species it is. And a friend might see other details that you might miss. So it's fun to go out with a friend um, to try to identify these plants and discuss it. Family characteristics. Uh, flowering families have characteristics much less like our own families do. Um, and knowing the characteristics of about a dozen families will help you identify the majority of plants here on the front range. And here on the front range, we also have a list called the 19 big families. And what do I mean by big families? <clears throat> it's simply the flowering families that have the most species in them growing in this area. So like the sunflower family is a big family. Uh, the pea family, the mustard family. Here on the front range, we have lots of species in those families growing. So if you know the family characteristics of those families, you're at least likely to go, that plant belongs in the pea family. And then that way you can go directly to that family in your uh, more technical flower guide or plant guide and start being able to key out that plant. And what do I mean by dichotomous keys? It's simply a series of paired questions about the plant you want to identify, giving two successive pair of choices to choose from, and you choose the one that fits the flower you're looking at, and you finally arrive at the species in front of you. So the three flowers um, on this screen all belong to the same family, which I'm sure you all know is the sunflower family, the Asteraceae family, because one of the characteristics of the sunflower family is it has ray flowers and, and or disc flowers. The flower in the middle 
has both gray flowers and disc flowers. The flower on the right side only has disc flowers, no ray flowers, but it still fits in the sunflower family. And the flower on the left only has ray flowers, no disc flowers, but still belong, you know that's the sunflower family. So let me give you an example. Say you came across the flower on the left side and you knew it's in the sunflower family, but you don't know the name you would take your field guide, <clears throat> go to the sunflower family, and you go right to the first key, key A. And it's gonna give you two choices, one A and one B. I'll read one A. Flowers blue, pink, purple, or white. That doesn't fit my flower in the left-hand corner. So I go to one B. Flowers yellow or orange? Yeah, that fits my flower. So 1B, key 1B, tells me to go to key nine. I drop to key nine, I read those two choices, and I go on until finally I go, that's a species. It may take you, you may go you know, to key 15 or 16 before you finally figure it out. But I find that a very satisfying um, activity to finally figure out exactly what flower I have found. And that way you remember them too. So you wanna go on a wildflower hike or um, take a relative on a wildflower hike? What's the makings of a good wildflower hike? I look for accessible trailheads, easy to get to. I look for short hikes that begin and end with a lot of flowers. Um, again, short hikes, because you want to get to your destination, but remember, you're gonna spend a lot of time with maybe just one or two flowers you don't know. And I look for trails with a diversity of habitats. You may start out on a dry hillside, but soon you come to some wetlands or end up at a lake or you may end on top of the tundra because the more diverse of habitats, you'll get more flower families and species to see on one hike. And I always like one special flower that I'm gonna get wow um, out of, like this wood lily uh, that's become pretty rare. And I also think about when I go on a wildflower hike, for that area, when's the peak bloom? And what do I mean by that? Uh, peak bloom simply refers to the most likely time to view a wide range of flowers with the greatest number in bloom for that particular area you're, you're in. Again, it could be springtime, middle of summer or fall. Just think of what's blooming with the greatest number of flowers. So let me give you some suggestions. <clears throat> it's probably a little late for this year, but Pawnee National Grasslands out east really comes alive with a lot of colors in May and about the first week of June. This is the West Pawnee Butte. It's a three mile round trip hike out to West Pawnee Butte. You can go to the east uh, one also it's a little further and there's many other trails out there. You're likely to see the Perky Sioux, which is in the foreground here, or the Silky Milk Fetch, which grows in large purple mats on the sandy floor. And on the bottom here is the Prickly Gilea. It belongs to the Phlox family and it tends to open late in the evening with these pretty yellow golden flowers, and it's very fragrant. So it's a really nice flower to see out there in the late evening. Other flowers you're likely to see at Pawnee National Grasslands. Here's a close up of the Perky Sioux. The Plains Flax, 
is in the same family as the blue flax, which is blooming now here um, along the Front Range. And the uncommon white pistamen likes to bloom on the plains and in the foothills. So if you missed it this year, put it on your list for next, about mid-May is a good time, the end of May to go. And put this hike on your list at Pawnee National Grasslands. The foothills, where grasslands give way to ponderosa forest and shrubs. They are full of spring flowers in April and May and June. The common ones are past flowers, spring beauties. Here in Rocky Mountain National Park, Lumpy Ridge is a good trail to go on in the spring for these flowers. I also like if you haven't been to Button Rock Preserve, um, a little north of Lyons, northwest of Lyons, is a great trail to find a lot of early spring flowers. Other common flowers in the spring are the wallflower, salsify, and Colorado loco. The montane zone um, is where you find lodgepole pines, spruce, and aspen forests. It also is characterized by cooler temperatures. Fireweed, yellow monkey flower, chiming bells are quite common in the montane zone. And chiming bells here in the Front Range has two species. One smaller, it's also called prairie bluebells. It likes to grow in the foothills, only about 10 inches high. And then we have the taller chiming bells that are called streamside bluebells that grow in the montane to the alpine. Um, well, subalpine, it can be quite tall and likes to grow near the streams. Golden banner is quite common in the montane zone as well as miner's candle. And uh, may I suggest in the montane zone, the Tanahutu Trail. It's located in Rocky Mountain National Park. It's on the west side of the park. And the west side of the divide receives more precipitation, resulting in thicker, lusher vegetation and different species than grow here on the east side of the divide. And the Tanahutu Trail, I like to do it as a one-way car shuttle hike. You can leave a car at the Kawanichi Visitor Center and drive a car back to the Green Mountain Trailhead and it's a 5.8 miles one way. And Tanahutu means in Arapaho, big meadow. So you will be following this big meadow the entire way. So you'll be along the stream side, you will come to some dry pine areas and some seeps. So you get a lot of um, diverse habitats. You may find this western red columbine that I do not see blooming on the east side of the divide. And if you're lucky, you may see some four-legged species um, like these five bull moose in the big meadow. And I think they're eating elephant heads and bistort and grasses. The subalpine. I describe that as a transition zone between the montane and the alpine. You usually find subalpine uh, vegetation like subalpine firs, Engelmann spruce, bristlecone pines, and many stunted trees um, due to the severe weather conditions that high and the very short growing season. So these stunted trees are called crumb holes. And crumb holes is a German word. You can see them in the foreground, um, foreground here in the front of, this, of the picture. It's a German word for crooked wood. 
And this is simply where seeds of the firs and spruce blow up to the subalpine, alpine areas. But because of the severe weather conditions and short growing season, they cannot grow up to be trees. But the branches start rooting along the ground and they do become very entangled and crooked and twisted and growing very thick together. And this is called crumb holes. And as a hiker, I would advise you avoid hiking through crumb holes, very scratchy, and that crooked wood will trip you every time. So remember to try to hike around them and not through them. Several Dollar Lake, um, above the town of Georgetown on Ganella Pass is a wonderful hike. It's about four miles round trip, so it's short, but it starts from beginning to end full of wildflowers from the subalpine all the way to the alpine. It's a pretty eater, easy, moderate trail. I remember it's a trailhead seeing a whole field of sneezeweed and again, as you go up the trail, there's monkshood, larkspur, such a variety of flowers um, to Silver Dollar Lake. And if you want a little extra bonus, Murray Lake is a half mile above Silver Dollar Lake. So you can certainly climb up there. I think the elevation of Murray Lake is 12,000 feet. So you'll get a lot of good alpine flowers. And in August, you'll see several species of gentians. You'll see the French gentian, the Perry gentian, um, the Northern gentian, and again in August, the Arctic gentian for sure. But La Gulch, this is near Berthet Pass, is a wonderful hike starting in the montane zone and ending in the Alpine. So again, you get a lot of diversity in your wildflowers. In fact, Butler Gulch is known for 100 species, at least 100 species of wildflowers. It's a five mile in and out hike, so not too long. And again, full of different species of wildflowers. I will warn you, you may get your feet wet. There's several stream crossings on this trail, but um, well worth the effort. The Perry Primrose, Mountain Laurel uh, are some common flowers you'll find in the subalpine. Alpine, probably my favorite um, place to be. Uh, it's the land above trees. There are no trees growing that high, but there's a lot of plant activity at the Alpine. And again, remember Colorado has the most coverage of tundra in the lower 48. So there's a lot of places to explore here in our um, state. You'll find things like alpine forget-me-nots, alpine phlox, the big rooted spring beauty. And I call the plants that grow above 11,000 feet masters of survival and adaptation. They have to overcome many challenges to grow and bloom um, at this elevation. They have to endure a very short growing season low temperatures, they're exposed to strong, strong winds and storms, and often drought conditions on the tundra. So how do they cope living that high with all these harsh, severe conditions? I know all of you have probably been on the tundra, either hiking or going up Trail Ridge Road or Mount Evans. And do you see any tall plants up there? No, all the plants are very low growing to the ground, only a few inches high. 
And like the alpine forget-me-not and the alpine phlox, they actually grow on mounds um, right on the ground. So when those strong winds and storms come up, they don't blow these flowers down, they simply blow over them. So that's one thing, they grow low to the ground. And most of the alpine plants have fine hairs covering their leaves and stems and sometimes back of the petals as well. And these fine hairs help trap heat and moisture. And a lot of them have very deep tap roots, some 10, 12 feet deep. And that help, and they spread out. So it helps find water, but also those deep tap roots help keep them anchored down to the thin soil on the tundra. So yes, masters of survival and adaptation. And I also think the tundra is very special because the alpine tundra has their own little communities up in, in that high elevation. Felt fields are simply field of rocks on tundra slopes. It's usually very dry and windy there, but that's where you'll find the tiny Christian plants, like the forget-me-nots. Snow beds is simply where snow persists late into summer, but hardy plants can grow under that snow. In fact, that's where they want to grow, and often you'll see them pop up right through the snow, like these alpine snow buttercups. Boulder fields, if you've been on Long's Peak, we, it has a big boulder field before the keyhole. And that's just an area of large boulders strung over each other, but it creates pockets of dirt that are blown between the boulders. And when this is warm by the sun, the boulders provide good shelter for plants. I always think of the sky pilot when I think of the boulder field. I see lots of sky pilot, again, that has wedged into these boulders and has found a good home. Talus and scree slopes are simply steep slopes where smaller gravel has been weathered down. But again, plants find a home between the warm scree and their roots actually help stabilize the ever-moving rocky slope. Like dwarf mountain ragwort, it can go quite large <clears throat> and spread out among these scree slopes. And you can see how the roots do help stabilize that rocky slope. Alpine meadows. This is where taller plants can grow they're sheltered by rolling dips in the tundra. There's usually less wind and more sorrel there for them to grow. And there's room to spread out. So usually they grow in large patches with grasses filling in. A good example of um, a flower that likes these high alpine meadows is the arrow leaf ragwort or senecio. You can see on the left, it grows in large patches up there. And alpine marshes and bogs. Yes, the alpine can actually have a bog. It's where flattening slopes are at the bottom of the mountainside and melting snow feeds the ground, usually all summer, keeping it very boggy and marshy at, that, at the bottom of that slope. And plants that like to grow there do enjoy the wet and cold, like marsh marigolds and glow flowers. So a very unique habitat is the alpine tundra. Orchids. Some people are very surprised when I talk about orchids in the high country of Colorado. And the orchid family is the largest flowering family in the world. It's about 30,000 species of orchids. So I think it's only fair that Colorado can call 26 species home. And the ones you probably are seeing now 
Well, the rattlesnake plankton orchid blooms in um, August, but you'll see the spotted coral root now on trails. Um, it's pretty common. It's usually this dark reddish brownish um, plant, has no chlorophyll with these wine purple spots on it. However, keep in mind this uh, species, Corallorhiza maculata, also can be a yellowish or orangish color, and it can have very light spots. It's awfully, um, often confused with the yellow coral root when actually it's really the Corallorhiza um, genus. And then you have the rattlesnake plankton orchid, which is, this is the giant one that's in the middle and on the right side. There's two species in Colorado. And the more common is the giant rattlesnake plankton orchid. And once you know the leaves, you see it in a lot of places, you'll start recognizing it. Again, it doesn't bloom to about August. It has dark um, evergreen, basil leaves growing at the bottom of the stem or the stalk with a white mid rib down the center of the leaf. And the less common, in fact, it's rare, the dwarf rattlesnake plankton orchid, the insert in this uh, slide, you see the leaves and the pattern on the leaves does resemble a rattlesnake skin. That's how it got its name. I have not seen the dwarf rattlesnake plankton orchid. I have not found it yet, but um, it's out there. It is a rare orchid though. And here's the yellow coral root, also called the northern coral root. And it's in the same genus as the spotted the coral ariza, and it's usually a more of a greenish yellow. And the trick to identifying the um, coral roots is looking at the shape of the lips. And again, the keys will tell you, but uh, the spotted coral root has kind of big ears at the bottom of the lip, but the yellow coral root is um, more straight and wider, the lip. And at the end, you can see those three little notches. That's a real characteristic of the yellow core root. And the key on core roots is looking at the shape and different um, sizes of the lip. And the lip is a petal. It's called a lip petal. And most orchids also have a hood petal covering um, going over the lip. Other orchids um, that you'll find on the front range, white bog orchids, green bog orchids, and there's a couple species of each. And these are probably the hardest orchids to identify down to species because they all look very similar. And the key on identifying bog orchids is again, looking at the shape and length of the lip. Um, that's the lip petal. And the lip petal on these orchids have a spur behind it. So also the keys are gonna talk about is the lip longer than the spur, that will indicate a di the different species. We have some rare orchids in Colorado. The fairy slipper or calypso orchid is considered rare. The brownie lady slipper, also called cluster lady slipper orchid. And the yellow lady slipper is not only on the rare list, it's on the endangered species list. One, because of loss of habitat, um, diversions of water for development, but mostly because people have tried to dig them up and transplant them, 
and orchids, wild orchids do not transplant. Um, they have a special relationship with fungi that they need to germinate and grow. And we just can't recreate. Um, they decide what fungi they need to grow in and um, get their nutrients from, and it's hard to duplicate. So just enjoy them when you see them, take a lot of photos and let them um, remain there for others to see and enjoy. The heart leaf tway blade orchid. Um, and if you see one, you'll see lots of them. They like to grow by wet areas, stream sides. They're pretty common. Um, Joyce Gilhorn was a well-known botanist here in Colorado. She has passed away, but she nicknamed the twi-blade orchid, um, the heart leaf, dancing ladies. And again, you need that lens, that hand lens. Look closely at the flowers. The lip petal here is split um, at the end, forming like two legs. And the upper petal, lip petal, has two appendages that kind of resemble arms. And I think the petal above and the sepals surrounding it kind of look like hair, a head, headdress. And so can't you envision dancing ladies when you look at this orchid? I can never look at it um, anymore without saying dancing ladies. Hope you find it this summer. Other rare wildflowers we have here in the front range is the spurless blue columbine. And this is not a different species, it's just a variety of the Colorado blue columbine, which is our state flower, Aculegia. And they like to hybridize a lot, columbines do. So you'll find different colors and combinations. And again, one that's quite rare is the spurless blue columbine. And you can see here, one of them does not have spurs, but the one above it is all blue with spurs. So it's fun to see um, what the columbines do out there. And the flower on the right is the dwarf alpine columbine, or called Rocky Mountain Blue Columbine. And it grows in the alpine. Uh, it's very small very unique with its petals and sepal shape. And it's endemic to Colorado. It's not known to grow anywhere else but in the state of Colorado. And it's starting to bloom right now in the high peaks. In Rocky Mountain National Park, you can find it on Twin Sisters Peak. It's also um, can be found on Pikes Peak. I think one of the trails um, you see it often on Pikes Peak is the Elk Park area. So it's a very uh, beautiful flower to find. And again, very special to Colorado. The wood lily is becoming a rare flower. Again, lots of habitat, but people have tried to dig them up and transplant them. And the rock sassafras, which grows in the montane and subalpine, is not only endemic to Colorado, but it's endemic to the front range of Colorado, not known to grow anywhere else, but on the front range. And again, um, you can find it on Pikes Peak, again, in the Elk Park Range area. And here in Rocky Mountain National Park on Lumpy Ridge, it likes to grow in between uh, rocks, in, in cracks along rock walls. It's quite a beautiful and unique flower. Thistles. Some people hear the word thistles and think they're um, a noxious plant. However, there are 15 native species in Colorado of thistles and only five non-native. The ones that are problematic 
to the front range are the Canadian and the bull and the musk. And um, this is a very important to insects, birds, and browsing wildlife. And it also adds diversity to our plant communities. So get to know your thistles. They're in the sunflower family. This is a rather alien looking alpine mountain thistle. It was quite tall, about three feet tall. Cecium scope pullerome, alpine mountain thistle. <clears throat> I used to think come August, there was nothing new to see or find out there, but I was wrong. Um, gentians tend to be later summer bloomers. And the northern ginger on the left is probably um, the first one to bloom in the third week of July. The star gentian is a subalpine, alpine gentian. And the peri gentian, which you'll find all the way from the montane to the subalpine. And I've seen it bloom through October if the weather is nice. And these three definitely start blooming later. Uh, again, the last week of July, August, the little friends gentians, an uncommon gentian to find. It only grows about four or five inches tall at the most. The friends gentian likes a, to put its feet in a lot of wet areas, so around streams. Again, it's an, a subalpine plant. And the arctic gentian grows in the alpine. And they used to say, when you find the Arctic gentian blooming, winter's not far behind. However, the last few years, I've been finding it blooming the first week of August. So um, I hope that's still not true about winter being close behind uh, the first week of August. But gentians are a very beautiful family um, to find and we're very lucky to have so many species in Colorado. Another late bloomer are asters. Um, these, this is the tansy Patterson aster. It's kind of um, a sprawling plant, can be quite tall, three feet tall, as well as the porter aster, tall and kind of sprawling along. You'll find it on trail and road size in August, September, October. And folks have asked me, how do you tell a daisy from an aster? Well, one, I just mentioned asters bloom later in the summer. If you find a composite in April, May, June, which uh, daisies are, it's most likely a daisy. And again, why is that important? Because if you're trying to identify it and it's May and you see this composite flower, usually white or lilac color, pink, purple, you can go right to the sunflower family and start looking. Uh, daisies only have one genus and that's Eridron. And you can skip looking in the asters. And another thing, daisies have very narrow ray flowers. So this is a daisy on the right-hand side. And you can see how thin those ray flowers are. And the aster on the left side has broader ray flowers. And again, asters tend to bloom later in summer. And for me, a real key is look behind the petals these um, modified leaves behind the petals what are called bracts, B-R-A-C-T-S, bracts, and they cover the bud before the flower opens, protecting that bud. So they're behind the flower petals. And if you see the um, daisy on the right-hand side has only one or two even straight rows of these bracts. Whereas the asters on the left side has several uneven rows of bracts, kind of much like shingles on a roof, looking, and they're usually hairy. So I always turn it over and look at that usually first and go, oh yeah, that's an aster. 
The American bistort, it's a common uh, flower all the way from the montane, and there is a sub -al um, an alpine bistort, but the American bistort can also grow in the alpine tundra. It's also known as minor smelly socks. I don't know if any of you have taken time to smell a bistort, but next time you see one, take time to get down and smell it. Some people say it has a very stinky smell. I'd rather say it's a pungent odor, but it has a purpose. Up in the high altitudes, there's very few bees, but a lot of flies. And what a better way to attract a pollinator if it happens to be a fly than with a stinky smell. So I think the American bistro is a good example, again, of an adaptation for survival with a stinky odor. And the alpine sunflower, nicknamed Old Man of the Mountain. Again, because if you look behind the flower, the leaves and stem and even the bracts on the flower is covered with thick white woolly hairs. Remember to trap moisture and heat for the flower. But it, these white thick woolly hairs give it its nickname, Old Man of the Mountain. And this sunflower always faces east probably to help shelter it from the winds and storms from the west. An old man in the mountain is a monocorpic plant, meaning it takes many years to mature to bloom, sometimes 10 to 12 years. But once it blooms, it only blooms once, then it dies. Same as the um, green gentian, a monument plant, elkweed, Again, has many common names. It's a minocarpet plant, minocarpet plant. It takes 20 or more years to mature to bloom. And once that plant blooms, it also dies, only blooms once. I like to think these beautiful plants just give us, gives us its best at the very end. So that's the end of today's program. Um, I can take a few questions and I also will leave you with um, some of my favorites to end the program with. So are there any questions? Yeah, hold on Marlene, let me get everybody unmuted here. Okay. All right, everybody, you are now live. If you want to ask Marlene any questions. I would like to ask where we could find the spurless blue columbine. Well, I will tell you, I'm, I'm pretty guarded in some of the flowers, especially the orchid. But Hermit Park <clears throat> is a Larimer County open space near Estes Park. Hermit Park. And they're right on a roadway. And so they're pretty easy to find on, on this roadway um, in Hermit Park. Um, they like to grow in aspen groves. So again, um, you can go to the end of this dirt road and park and walk on another dirt road, getting close to the, and look in the aspen groves. Marlene, how do you spell the I couldn't quite understand what you were saying. Mono something of the old man of the mountain. Okay. Monocarpet is M-O-N. Um, oh. M-O-N. Oh. M -O, o. Mono. Carpet. C-A-R-P-I-C. Thank you. And then somebody in the chat, Marlene, asked if you had a good recommendation for a, a good hand lens. 
Oh, yes, the Colorado Native Plant Society, you can go on their website into their store and they sell a great one that you can even push a button and it's lighted and it's only $10. And it has a little light on it, so it's very handy. We can see you, Diana Bliss. Oops. Does anybody else have any, any questions? Yes. Um, I earlier sent in a flower for her to try to identify from my picture from things that are going all over Grand County. Yes, and I think Jeff's going to forward you an email. He it's did. He did. And uh, I did get some better. I was just like one minute late getting here because I took more pictures of the leaves. And I was wondering, do you have a place that we could send